We've already seen that the symmetries of an equilateral triangle form a group, and we call that group S3. And that group has six elements, and the elements are each functions on the set 1, 2, 3. And we can also think of them as different symmetry operations on the equilateral triangle. This was a non-abelian group of order 6. What about other geometric shapes? So let's consider a square. And we're going to look at four basic types of operations. And these are things that we can do to the square that will bring the square kind of back to where it was. So one thing we could do is just leave it alone. That's not very exciting, but it counts. We could also rotate the square. That would bring the square back to where it was. We could also flip it about a perpendicular bisector. So what I mean by that is we would flip it maybe around this axis right here. This would be like a perpendicular bisector. Um, so that would be flipping it around there, or another perpendicular bisector would be right there. This would be another place that we could flip it about. Or we could flip it about a diagonal, and there's two ways to do that. Because there are two diagonals, we could flip it about that diagonal, or we could flip it about this diagonal. So we're going to look at each of these four types of operations. So the first operation, I'm going to call that row with a subscript 0. And that's the one where we take the square and we leave it alone. So I'm going to number the corners of the square, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this is going to make the square stay exactly where it was, 1, 2, 3, 4. Next, I'm going to have row with a subscript 1. And think of row as a rotation, just as we did with the triangle. So in this case, I'm going to rotate the square counterclockwise. So here's the square I'm going to start out with. And it's going to become something that looks like this. So the 1 now is going to rotate over here. The 2 will be up here, the 3 over here, and the 4 down there. Next, I have row 2. And that's going to take the square, and it's going to rotate it twice, in a sense back to where the square was. So now, the 1 is going to be up here, the 2 here, the 3 here, and the 4 here. Then I have row 3, and that's rotating the square one more time. So now, the 1 will be over here, the 2 here, the 3 here, and the 4 here. Alright, that takes care of the leave it alone and the rotate it types of operations. What about flipping about a perpendicular bisector? So for that, I'm going to call this mu with a subscript 1. Here's my square. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip it about a perpendicular bisector that goes straight down the middle. So the bisector that I'm looking at is this one right here. So if I look at this uh, axis here, it looks like the 1 and the 2 are going to switch places, and the 3 and the 4 are going to switch places. So now the 1 will be over here and the 2 over here, and then the 3 will be here and the 4 over here. And then mu2 would be a flip about the other perpendicular bisector. So now that's going to be flipping about this bisector right here. And so it looks like if I were to do that, that the uh, 1 and 4 will switch places and the 2 and the 3. So the 1 will be here, the 2 will be up here the 3 down here and the 4 down here. And now I want to look at the last basic operation that was flipping about the diagonal. And for the diagonal, I'm going to use delta. And this will be a delta subscript 1. So that's going to flip about this diagonal uh, right here, the 1 going from the 4 down to the 2. So the 2 and the 4 shouldn't change places. They should stay where they are. The 1 and the 3 should swap. So the 1 will be up here. The 2 will stay where it was, the 3 will be down here, and the 4 will stay where it was. And then the last one, delta 2, that will be a flip about the other diagonal. And that's the one that's joining the 1 and the 3. So that's this diagonal right here. So the 1 and the 3 should stay where they are, and the 2 and the 4 sh should switch places. So the 1 will stay where it was, the 2 will be up here now, the 3 will stay where it was, and the 4 will be down here. So these eight operations form a group, and I'm going to call that group D with a subscript 4. And it has eight elements. 
And you should know that the naming of this group, this D4, is not unique. Some people call this D8. This is a dihedral group. Any of the symmetries of a regular polygon will be labeled with a D for dihedral and then a subscript. And so you should know that I'm calling this D4, but some textbooks would call this D8 because it has eight elements. I'm calling it D4 because it has four sides. So in this case, we have eight operations, and the binary operation, just as it was before if the triangle, is composition of functions. And we can think of each of these uh, operations here, each of these elements of the group as a function from the set one, two, three, four to the set one, two, three, four. So let's look at an example. Suppose I look at delta one, that was a flip about the diagonal that was joining two and four. Well, if I look at the two sets, one, two, three, and four here, what happened? Well, the one, that went to a three, the two stayed where it was, the three went to one, and the four stayed where it was. So you can see how each of these elements of this group really is a function on the set 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if that's the case, then we should be able to compute something like delta 2 composed with row 3. This is composition of function, so it's delta 2 of row 3 of x. So here's row 3, that's the thing that did the rotation. And delta 2, that was the thing that flipped about the diagonal that joined 1 and 3. But remember, composition of functions acts in a certain order. So the first thing that we would do is this row 3, that's the inside part. And then delta 2 is going to act on this square right here. So what did delta 2 do? Well, that was the flip about this diagonal. So this thing here and this thing here stay the same, and these two swap. So these guys here, they swap. But remember, we're acting on this square right here. So this isn't really a 4. This is really a 1. This isn't really a 1. This is really a 2. This is not really a 2. This is a 3. And this is not really a 3. This is a 4. I'm just copying the numbers that are on this square right here and bringing them down here. And so these two are going to and you're going to swap places, so the 3 will be up here, and the 1 will be down here. And these two are going to stay where they, where they were, so the 2 will stay here, and the 4 will stay here. If we look at this in terms of our functions on the set 1, 2, 3, and 4, it looks like 1, which initially started up here, switched to be down here. So what did that do? Well, the 1 went where the 2 was. So the 2, if you look where we started here, the 2 was here. So the 1 went where the 2 was here. What happened to the 2? So the 2, which is here, swapped places with the 1 because it ended up down here. And then what about the 3? The 3, which was right here, now is over here. And so that swapped places with the 4. And so the 4 went to where the 3 was. So this looks a lot like mu1. Mu1 does exactly this. So we can say that delta2 composed with row 3 is mu1. Or in shorthand, delta2 row 3 equals mu1. OK, now let's look at row 3 composed with delta2. So here's delta2, and here's row 3. And remember what row 3 does. Row 3 is a counterclockwise rotation all the way around so the one then ends up all the way up here. So another way to think of that is to think of it kind of going back in this direction. It would be accomplishing the same thing if everything just went back one space uh, clockwise. Okay, but remember this is not the square that we're acting on. We're acting on this square actually for composition of functions. So the one actually stays where it is. This four is actually a 2. This 3 stays where it is, and this 2 is actually a 4. And now I have to rotate everything. So this 1 is now up here. Well, that's perfect. There it is. This 2 is now over here, so that's really a 2. This 3 is now down here. Perfect. There it is. And this 4 is now over here, so this is actually a 4. And now let's look at this on the sets 1, 2, 3, and 4. What happened to the 1? So the 1, which was right here, ended up up here. So it kind of 
swapped with the four. So the one went to where the four was. How about the two? Well, the two, which was down here, ended up up here. The two swapped with the three. And then the three swapped with the two, and the four swapped with the one. This looks a lot like mu two. So we can say that row three composed with delta two is mu two. And so we also saw from before that delta two composed with row three was mu one. So in particular, row three delta two does not equal delta two row three, and this is a non-abelian group. Order matters. So now we see that D4 is a non-abelian group of order eight. So let's look at the group table. So for this table here, we're going to list the eight elements that we have along the top here. So we have row zero, row one, row two, row three, and then we have our mu one and mu two, and then our delta one and delta two. And then same thing along the side here. So we have row zero, row one, row two, row three, and then we have our mu one, our mu two, our delta one, and our delta two. And the order that we're going to compute in, first we're gonna do something from the left and then on the top here. So if we look at what we had before, we had row three delta two equals mu two. That means the row three I'm gonna look at on the left here, so this row three right here, and then we'll go to the delta two, and then this spot right here should be mu two. And then we also saw that delta two row three, so here's delta two, here's row three, that was mu one. Okay, so I can fill those two in right now. What else can I fill in? Well, I know that row zero didn't do anything, I just left it alone, so that means I can just copy this row right here. Everything can just come down here. And then similarly, this column right here I can copy. So this is row one, row two, same thing all the way down. And by the way, these letters I'm using to denote these operations are not unique. There's different notations. This is just the notation that I happen to be using. Different textbooks will uh, maybe call these different things, but this is what I find to be helpful. Now what about row one and row one? Row one composed with row one. So that should be, if you imagine doing two rotations, that should be the same thing as row two. Row one and row two should be row three. And row one and row three would bring us back to where we were, that would be row zero. Row two and row one, that should be row three row two and row two, that should bring us back to where we were, and row two and row three should bring us to row one. And so you kind of see a pattern here. This will be row zero, this will be row one, and this will be row two. Okay. What about the flips? Well, if I were to do mu one and mu one, that would kind of undo one another. So that should be row zero, and that should be the same for any of these flips here. This should always give us back row zero for all of these. Okay. So now comes the part where we have to do some computations. And so I'll leave you to figure out exactly why these happen to be what they are, but I'll just fill in a few of these here so we can get the idea. So this is a delta one and this is a delta two. And remember the other rules that in any row or any column, each element should appear exactly once. So that's another way that we can kind of figure out what's going on. So now this right here, I'll tell you is a mu two, which means this has to be a mu one right here, just has to be. I will also tell you that this square down here, a four by four square will be all rows, which means that this must be a delta one because there's uh, this, these will all be row operations here. Okay, and I'll give you a few more of these here. Let's see what else can we do. This is a delta two right here. And if that's a delta two, this has to be a mu one. And this right here is a mu two, and this is a mu one, and this is a delta one, and this is a delta two. Great. Okay, how about on this side over here? So let's look at this uh, four by four. So we have this row, this column right here. How about these ones along the bottom? This is a mu two right here, and this is a delta one. All right. 
and this is a mu1 right here and again I'll leave you to check these computations yourself so you can see that they actually do work and this is a delta 2 right here and this is a mu2 right here okay so now these two have to be deltas and these two have to be deltas and so if I know one of them I know the other three this one right here happens to be delta 1 which means this is delta 2, which means this is delta 1, which means this is delta 2. Great. And this has to be mu1, and this has to be mu2, because I already have a mu2 here. So now I just need to do this part down here. And so I'll tell you that this is a row 2, this is a row 3, and this is a row 1. This is a row 3, and this is a row 2. And so let's see, what else can we do based off of this? Well, we must have row one and then a row two, okay. And then we have to have a row one somewhere down here. Well, I know right here this has to be row two because I oh, don't have a row two yet in this column. And this is a row one, this is a row three, which means this is a row one and this is a row three. So again, I'll let you check all of the uh, entries in the table and again, Remember that in each row and each column, each element should appear exactly once. So is this a group? Well, let's look at the group properties. Is it closed? It is indeed closed. Is it associative? Well, we know that composition of functions is associative, so this is associative. Is there an identity? Well, you might guess that row zero is the identity, and it is. That's the thing that leaves the square alone. And what about inverses? Well, we see that row one we look at the table right here, row one and row three are inverses of each other, row one and row three. And row two and row two, let's see, so row two is its own inverse. And then all of the flips are their own inverse, all the mu's and the deltas. So yes, everything does have an inverse, which means that this is a group. In fact, it is a non-abelian group, meaning that the operation is not commutative.